pennies to hundreds of dollars before they collapse back down, correct? Yeah. You know, the funny part about that was a lot of the real mania took place, believe it or not, after the gold price peaked in January of 1980. And you're right. Some of these stocks went ballistic. They went up a hundredfold. Now, I don't think you have to believe in that degree of ridiculous to invest in them now. I mean, I can quite comfortably say that any number of good quality juniors, when the gold price really starts to move sharply to the upside, I think they can easily rise five to ten times and outstrip the rise in the gold price. But again, for the average investor, I would be more inclined to buy a a well-managed fund of juniors because they're not all going to participate. But if you're if you're an astute investor and you trust your sources and you and you know the area pretty well, then you can rifle shoot more and try to you know pick the very best of the winners. But there are going to be enormous numbers of winners once this thing gets out when the train leaves the station. I know that investors put quite a bit of money at Sprott in the United States side. People put money with John Hathaway as another example. But let's just get real here, John. The vast majority of these people should not be playing around in the junior sector. It's a people business. You have to be extremely well connected. It's over people's heads. And as you said, they should have the funds managed. I mean, that's what you're saying here, correct? Well, yeah, I'm not trying to talk our own book either. I mean, I really believe that. I mean, I managed gold funds for 15 years. And I mean, I saw how difficult it was as a professional. It was probably had the best uh, window into the industry. I mean, there's just a lot of chicanery. And I mean, there's a lot of even the stuff that looks like it could work. People really don't know what's under the ground until they start to mine it. I mean, even the drill holes can't give you the whole picture. So it's a risky business and you need diversification without question. But having said that, when they, at the right time, I mean, the, the collectively, the whole area is going to do spectacularly well. It's just they're not all going to do it, but with a, a wide portfolio, of, uh, you're going to do exceptionally well. Very quickly, is that where the real value is right now when you look at the whole groups, the majors and the mid-tiers and then the smaller producers? Well, I think if you go down the sort of the bigger stocks, even they're relatively attractive today. They've been beat up. But I I think for pure leverage to the upside, as you go down, the majors would have the least, the mid caps would have the second least, and the juniors, the the, the right juniors, would have the most. But I I like some small, you know, smaller to mid cap producers because I don't think they reflect their earning power to near the extent, for example, the seniors do. Well, some of them, I think, are selling at four times earnings in the next year or two. That's correct. But that's absurd, John. There's no reality to that, meaning there's tremendous room for multiple expansion going forward. Well, there's no question. And I think what it reflects, Eric, is there's no belief in the gold sector at this point. I find it astounding to me. I, I mean, I just I can't believe it, actually, given the compelling fundamentals, which I try to get across to people. You know, what an unbelievable opportunity this is. And yet it seems to fall in deaf ears. Somebody said to me, one of the reasons is there's still alternatives. I mean, the U.S. stock market's been sort of, you know, bubbling along. And that gold does best and gold shares do best is when it's the only game in town when nothing else is working. That could well come up in the not too distant future. I coined the phrase the Pac-Man phase. Yep to describe the coming consolidation in the mining sector. Is that time now upon us, John? Not quite. I don't think that the seniors, I don't think the guys that run these companies have the degree of confidence in their own product yet that they're prepared to get, you know, pretty aggressive in making acquisitions. They're still using, uh, I think, incorrect long-term goal pricing when they're trying to evaluate acquisitions. Is part of that because they went through a depression and a lot of these guys are like dinosaurs? They're just stuck in that mentality of the depression? You know, that's a good question. I think there's an element of that. I think there's another element, and that is that very few people understand the gold market. And, you know, as I said, I'm glad I chose this area to sort of focus on because you don't have to be that clever to be the smartest guy in the block because nobody knows nothing. (laughs) So... You know, I really, I, I say that, it sounds kind of facetious, but there's an element of truth to it. I don't think a lot of these guys that run these gold companies understand their product in the least. I'll tell you one guy who does is Rob McEwen. I mean, he's a guy that I've got an enormous respect for. He understands the gold market perfectly, but he's unusual amongst the mining executives. Yeah, and there's a few others out there, Ian Telfer. Yeah, tell, yeah there are a few, but by and large, a lot of them are more corporate
Right. And a good example of that is Frank Juster, who's really behind the scenes, but one of the true power brokers in the industry. And he did films and made a fortune there. He's back in the resource sector, but everything he touches seems to turn to gold, not to use that analogy here, but he just, he always has the hot hand. Let me go back to your speech here for just a minute. Quote, this remains one of the best supply demand and balance stories I have encountered in my long career. And it will only be enhanced by the existence of massive short positions that will be impossible to cover amid myriad paper claims on gold that dwarf the physical supply, which, by the way, is a subject for another day, end quote. Can you just elaborate on that, John? Well, yeah. I mean, what's going to come to the fore when this thing really gets out and runs is the fact that a lot of people are going to be holding paper gold vehicles that they think that they have the gold backing. All these paper gold vehicles, they can replicate the price gains in gold up to a point because they're using derivative backing and what have you. But when push comes to shove, at some point, the only thing you're going to want to have is physical and it's going to outstrip the paper gold market. And if you're in the wrong asset, you're not going to get the performance you think you're going to get. And so at that point, I think that when people realize they may have been had, the demand for physical gold is going to accelerate dramatically. Let me ask you, John, before I move on to some of your speech, some of the rest of it anyway. Last time we had the stock market, and it really it was a global collapse, this financial collapse. And so everything got sucked down, as you know, the mining shares included, right? But that is not always the case. Let's use January of 2000 to January of 2003. Stocks were hit hard. As you know, John, they really got hit hard in the United States especially. But the HUI more than doubled during that time frame. So they don't always go down when the markets go down. Well, no, that was an interesting time because the stock market was so elevated at the same time that the gold had been so out of favor and was so undervalued that uh, the gold market could run against the uh, the overall market. There's great debate today as to as if we had another big downdraft in the market, whether gold stocks would represent the market or whether they'd represent proxies for gold because in the event of a big drop in the gold or in the overall market i think maybe gold might wobble initially but then it would i think would take off to the upside so i'm in that small camp that believes that yeah there'd probably be a wobble to the downside in the gold shares and gold but then they would turn around and have more of a 2000 to 2002 experience than they had in this most recent downdraft when everything in the world went down Let me ask you a little bit of a strange question, just a hypothetical, John. Let's say that your wife, unbeknownst to you, went out and won a big lottery, and all of a sudden you had $100 million more in your hand, and it was U.S. dollars. What do you do with that? Because I know you. You're going to turn around and go, well, I don't want to sit in U.S. dollars because I know you. What would you do with that? Give me an idea how you would allocate that. Well, I'm a hard asset guy. Like, I mean, quite frankly, I I don't have a big problem with really good quality U.S stocks like i mean if you're going to hold your assets in u.s dollars outside of say precious metals and that i don't have a problem with owning johnson and johnson and and, and companies of that ilk you know you got to do some analysis to figure out which are the good sound companies with you know good dividend yields and businesses that can withstand almost anything but in the kind of world that i see which is going to be plagued by mounting inflation and very poor economic activity, I think good quality stocks that are providing a necessary service will do all right. What you don't want, the better question is what you don't want to own. And what you, in my opinion, I can't understand why anybody in their right mind would you own a U.S. bond. I just think <laughs> the, on the interest rates on offer and the potential debasement at hand, I mean, I, they will be guaranteed uh, certificates of confiscation which they were somebody termed years ago back in the 70s, and he was dead right then. And I think that day's coming back again. I remember one of the roundtables we did, you said I wouldn't buy a U.S. Treasury bond with your money, Eric. So yeah, I guess you're still in that well, camp. I haven't changed my mind. I mean, <laughs> so far I've been wrong because they've been okay. Yeah. But uh, in the end, they're now they're spewing them out by the trillions, and they're being monetized at a very aggressive rate. So, so to me, I, I don't see it. But so far it's so good for the, uh, the bondholders. But... Uh, well, you've got the biggest bond house in the United States, PIMCO, Bill Gross saying that 80% of the U.S. debt that was created last year was monetized by the Fed. I mean, good grief. What does that tell you? This was also from that speech, quote, in conclusion, I now firmly believe that the chances of gold ever trading below $1,000 per ounce are remote. In fact, I strongly suspect that gold is going to stage a parabolic rise from current levels in the not-too-distant future, a development that will come as a shock 
to the many detractors of the world's only real money. Let's talk about that for a minute, John, because as you said, on the mainstream media and et cetera, there are so many people talking about a bubble. You've got George Soros. You've got Noriel Rubini. There's all these people being trotted out to say gold's in a bubble, which is really just patently false and completely absurd. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, the George Soros one is interesting. He said the ultimate bubble is gold. What he didn't say is the ultimate bubble is arrived. I believe that the ultimate bubble conceivably is gold, because when the currencies go down the toilet, gold's going to unfathomable levels of price. And at that point, we could discuss whether 